open your hearts and your minds. This man is a great friend of mine. I've known him for a lot of years. Um, if you catch him at the end and ask him, he knows me even when before I started really, really following the Lord. When I was just starting to follow the Lord, he's seen my process. Him and his wife have opened their home to me. They love Jesus. They love young people. And so tonight, he's going to end our study on the resurrection. So I need you guys to listen. I need you guys to participate. And I need you guys to welcome Mr. Sean Cutchins. Thank you, thank you. Everybody looks all fired up tonight. Come on now. So, first of all, I will tell you, he was talking about Vacation Bible School. Please do not underestimate the impact that your age group has on those little kids. When we, we used to do Vacation Bible School every summer, and watching the way they look up to you guys, watching the way that they look for you as an example, watching the way that they just get so excited that you spend time with them. Don't underestimate that. And some of the best memories you'll have will be from being a helper and a, eventually a leader at Vacation Bible School. So uh, with that being said, let's go ahead and open up prayer real quick and then we'll get going. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here, Lord. I'm honored just to spend time with these young men and women who are here seeking you, seeking your face, Lord, and wanting to know more about your kingdom and to hear from your word. Father, I ask that you just give me the words to say that they'll have the ears to hear, Lord, and that we will truly have a different understanding when we leave here tonight of the importance of the resurrection. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so some of y'all got cards. Victor passed out cards. You got cards? Got that scripture ready? Be ready. I need you when, you when you read, I need you to read loud and clear. Because as you can tell, I'm very soft-spoken, I'm very quiet, and I'm very calm. So I need y'all to pick that up for me, okay? Said no one ever, right, honey? So I had two children. My wife had three. This is me, okay? So I don't ever want to grow up. Don't let the gray hair fool you, okay? I don't ever want to grow up. When Victor said, hey, ask Jen, can you ask Sean if he'd be willing to come speak about the resurrection? I was like, old people or young people? Young people, I'm in. I don't like hanging out with the old people. They're boring, okay? But what I'll tell you is this. <clears throat> I thought, all right, the resurrection. I, it's, it's probably the most important piece of who we are as Christians, but how much can I really say about the resurrection? So I got out my Bible, got out my phone, got out my pen, and man, the Lord just laid all kinds of stuff on me. And I was like, okay, I only got an hour. I'm going to need to calm down. But the one thing that um, really kind of hit me is if you talk about the resurrection, which we all know the resurrection is what happened, at what part of the story? What part of Jesus' story? Was it the beginning, the middle, or the end? End, right? And, and, and it's kind of hard to start at the end of a story. So then I started thinking, all right, well, let's talk about a little bit about the beginning of the story. Why? Why was Jesus here? What happened? Right? And then the Lord started rolling me in to talk a little bit about salvation, about what, what is the whole reason why we're at church. So I'm going to back us up just a little bit and talk just for a, a few minutes about how did we even get to the need for the cross and the resurrection, right? So, John 3, 16, we all know it. I hope so, right? The first scripture I ever learned, see it on the billboards. I mean, it's the, it's the scripture. Even most of your friends that don't go to church probably know John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever should believe in Him, what? Did not perish, but have everlasting life, right? That's, some, that, that's love. God loves us, right? God is, a, is both loving, but God is also holy. Would you agree? God is loving. God is all about us, but God is holy. God has a standard, right? And that standard says that God cannot tolerate sin, right? So if you think about how holy he was, he delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification because God had to find a way God loves us. God wants to be with us. God wants to, he, he allows us the opportunity to have free will because he wants what? He wants us to choose him, right? Not be, he didn't force us to come to love him. 
So when you think about salvation, God brought us to earth. I, I had a, a preacher tell me this one time. I said, help me understand more about why God would send us to earth. And right, we, we got the chance of messing up too. And he said, look at it like this. He said, I know there's a crazy way to think about it. He said, but think about it like this. If you had a bunch of sweet dogs and you had them all in a fence and every day you went in and you fed them and you pet them and you loved on them and then every morning you came out, you had food and you pet them and you fed them and you loved on them, those dogs are going to love you. What happens when you open up the door in the morning? What do they do? They run up to you and they, love, and they lick you with their bad dog breath and they get hair all over you, but they love you. He said, now, what would happen if you opened up the fence and went inside? How many of those dogs would stick around because they truly love you or they stick around because that's where they were forced to be? They had no choice. He said, now, he made a joke. He said, I'm not calling you dog. He said, but think about it like that. God brought us down here because he wanted us to have the opportunity to truly come to know him and love him. The problem is, is that by having our free will, what did the free will give us the opportunity to do? Who said it? I heard somebody say it loud and clear. Choose what? Choose, choose him. But what did it also give us the chance to choose? Sin. And the world got all up in it and messed us all up, Right? So can, can God as a holy God be in the presence of sin? And everyone agree that that's something you got to understand. You got to know that black and white. Can a holy God who knows no sin be in the presence of sin? He cannot. He cannot tolerate sin. There lies the problem. Okay. My problem is this. Like I, I struggle sometimes because I'm like, I, I feel like I do the right thing. I feel like I, I'm, I'm, I'm out here trying. I'm doing my best. But then I think about it. Have I ever lied? Ooh, every once in a while, I get nervous, get scared. Someone's going to be mad at me. And I'll real quick tell them something that ain't quite the truth. Right? My kids used to say, well, I didn't lie to you. I just didn't tell you the whole truth. And I'm like, so you lied by omission. Right? It's still a sinful nature. Right? Have I ever, here's one, all right, everybody get ready. Have I ever disrespected or disobeyed my parents? Uh oh, right? We've all been there. I was the world's worst. That's why I had three parents I had a mother, a father, and a belt. Woo! Because when I got disrespected, I got that tore up, right? But I never learned for some reason. But the point is, is what does the Bible say? The Bible tells you Ten Commandments, right? Respect your mother and your father. Bible tells us don't lie. Tells us don't steal. These are things that if you've done one, you've committed sin, and you're no longer able to be in the presence of God. And that's a scary place to be. People talk about what happens when you're, when you're not allowed to be in the presence of God. It's hell, right? you got all these stories about hell, but I'll tell you what I think about when I think about hell. I think about being separated forever from an all-loving Amazing God. Whatever else you might think about hell, the fact that I would be separated forever and ever and ever because of my sin. So what do we do? Yeah, terrifying, right? Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Right? So if we've all fallen short, what is in the, what is in the Old Testament that we're supposed to to have followed before Christ came, right? Anybody know? The Ten Commandments, the law. What's the problem with the law? The, the, what's that? Well, it isn't that the law has flaws. The problem with the law is, is it's so strict and it's so regimented and our sinful nature just doesn't line up. We can't line up to the law. We're, we're doomed from the beginning which is when we start to get to the good part, right? So look at it like this. So God's character, and this is what I wrote down. I said, God's character is such that he loves us so much that he sent the perfect sacrifice in our place. So look at it like this. Y'all ever watch the courtroom shows? Anybody ever, anybody like those shows where the courtroom and the judge and all the, they're in the, uh, you like those? I used to love watching those, especially in the early days when they were new, right? Because there was all kinds of craziness happened on the courtroom shows, 
right? But what's the one thing the judge do at the end? Take that big gavel and bam! Here's the verdict. So here's what happens. Sean stands before God in the courtroom, the courtroom of heaven, and runs down the list. All the crazy nonsense I've ever done. And he says, you're guilty. Can I argue it? He said, you're guilty. And what is the sentence that God lays down based on the guilt of my sin? Death and hell, right? People don't want to talk about hell. They get all, let's not talk about hell. It might hurt people's feelings. It's going to hurt more than your feelings, right? Hell is an eternal separation from God. God says, I'm sorry. I loved you so much I gave you a choice, but you couldn't live up. So the penalty is death and a separation from me for eternity. Eternity. Now I want you all to think about it. Some of you all sitting here thinking, talk about a long time. I'm going to have to sit and listen to this guy for the next 30, 40 minutes. That seems like forever. It's nothing. Right? It's nothing compared to eternity. But here's what's crazy. So he laid that gavel down and he said, Jen, you're guilty. And the penalty is death and an eternal separation. And at that moment, Jesus got down and he said, Father, they can't, they can't do that because I meet the criteria. I am a perfect sacrifice and I will pay the penalty for them. I will do the time. I will be in their place so that they don't have to have an eternal separation. And then they look, he looks at you and he says, do you accept this? What's crazy is the whole world has the opportunity to say, yes, I accept this. I do not want to be away from God, from, from that loving, amazing Father for eternity. Of course I accept this. But what's crazy is a lot of the world does not accept it. When you accept it, Jesus then took on the sin for you, where? On the cross, right? So that's how we kind of we get there. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice, and He died on the cross for our sins. So everybody get where we are, right? Loving God cannot know sin, but gave us free will because He loves us and wants us to love Him back because we choose to. The problem is we also choose sin, and in choosing sin... We separated ourselves from God. But Jesus, as the perfect sacrifice, took our place and died on the cross. The Bible says that the Father turned His back. I couldn't imagine. Turned His back on Jesus. And there He died on the cross for you. For you, and you, for you, and you. The whole room. All we have to do is accept it. So now we get to the resurrection. What if that was the end of the story? You understand that the resurrection is what makes our faith, what makes Christianity the real deal. You can talk about all these other religions. Do you know what the difference in all the other religions and Christianity is? Name some of the, the big people that the other religions claim. Name, name some people. Muhammad. Buddha. Anybody else? Can anybody else think of anybody? Muhammad, Buddha? Huh? Um, I think that's what they say. Rasta? Maybe. I don't know. Uh, but you know, you know what the difference? You can name them all, right? Do you know what the difference between them and Jesus is? They're dead. <laughs> dead. Stanking bones. Dead. Jesus laid in that tomb, went to Hades, did his thing, came back, victory, came up out of the grave. That's the difference. He defeated the death and the sin and the, the hell that we were due. Y'all ever heard of anybody in any other religion talking about their so-called main guy alive? Okay, so now... Let's read what it says real quick. So Matthew 28, 1 through 9 says, Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven 
and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing was white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. Crucified. Y'all understand, and we're going to get a little bit more into this. Jesus was dead. And I'm going to show you, we can prove that. Jesus was dead. Crucifixion was the most lethal, most brutal, most horrible way in history, in all of history to ever be killed. It's crazy. And then, if that wasn't enough, they stabbed him in the side with a spear. Right there. I don't know about y'all. I get a cut and start to bleed just a little bit, and I want to curl up in a ball and cry. And, and the beggar, please get me a Band-Aid and some aspirin and something. I can't imagine what you went through in crucifixion. But he was dead. They put him in the tomb. They knew he was dead, right? And then it says, He is not here, for he has risen. And he said, Come, see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you to Galilee, and there you will see him. See, how I, see I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and ran and told the disciples, and behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. The Apostle Paul boldly and bluntly stated this, from the resurrect, Apart from the resurrection of our faith and, message, and, and the message, it is all in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 19, who's got that? 1 Corinthians? That's fine, can you read that for me? Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how, how saved sought among you that there is no resurrection of the dead. But if there, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is, then is Christ not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. Okay. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. Then they also, which are fallen asleep in Christ, are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. So Paul basically said this. If Christ did not rise from the dead, our faith is done. It means nothing. The people who died, no one has hope. If Christ did not raise from the dead, Christianity is a joke. You understand that? We're all in here. If Christ did not rise from the dead, we're all in here wasting our time. Does that make sense? Because if he didn't rise from the dead, he didn't defeat death. And if he didn't defeat death, he didn't defeat sin. And if he didn't defeat death and sin, guess who's still guilty? So we might as well go live our lives like wild heathens. Because it doesn't matter. We're in trouble. So, just to be clear, and I want to reiterate this, our relationship with Christ is about our faith. Faith, faith, faith. You must have faith in Christ, right? God wants your love and trust through faith, period. Ephesians 2.8 By grace you have been saved through faith. Romans 3.28 For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. That's what we were talking about earlier. Apart from what you can do in the law, it doesn't matter, right? God doesn't want you to be able to boast, look how good I am. It is through faith. Romans 5.1 Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is about faith. But here's what's cool. God gives us so many things if we really open our eyes. God tells us in 2 Timothy, study the Word. Right? And I think sometimes people think, well, study the Word so I can get this amazing revelation, and you'll get those. 
You'll get these amazing things that God will drop on you. Victor, tell me. You'll read the Word. I get that, okay. You read it again, same thing. I get that, okay. And then one day you read that same thing the third time, and God blows your mind with amazing revelations. But you know what He also does? Sometimes God says, stop trying to overthink things and use some common sense. You understand to have faith doesn't mean you have to throw your mind in the garbage. Okay? Let's be clear on that. To have faith does not mean you got to throw your mind in the garbage. If you read God's Word and you really break things down and listen to what they're telling you, you can pick so many things out that make so much sense. But I think the first thing we have to ask ourselves is, all right, we're going to get real here for a second. How do we know? How do we know about Jesus? How do we know about His death? How do we know about the things He said? How do we know about the resurrection? How do we know about that? Where do we get that from? The Bible, right? So let's talk about, a sec just for a second, let's break down the Bible for a minute as a book. Because sometimes people will tell you, well, how do you know the Bible is real? How do you know it's just, how do you know it's, that even what it says is what the people said? You ever play that game where I start over here and I tell one thing and it goes around the corner and by the time I get over here, it don't make no sense. T telephone, right? That game's hilarious. Because you can start out over here like Susie has three apples, and by the time you get here, it's like Johnny has a goat. And you don't know how it got there, right? So let's talk about the Bible for a minute. The validity of the New Testament documents. All right, I'm going to read some of this just because, you know, some of it is a little bit um, wordy, and then we'll talk through it. So um, if the Bible is where we go, then we have to believe that it's the living, breathing, infallible Word of God. What does infallible mean? Does anybody know? What does it mean if it's the infallible Word of God? Take a guess. It's what he said. It is what He said. It don't matter whether you like it or not. It doesn't matter whether you agree with it or not. It's what He says, right? So how do we know that? All right, so let's talk about the New Testament. That's, right now we're talking about the resurrection. That was all in the New Testament. Jesus, He came, He was born of a virgin, He died knowing no sin, on the cross for you and me, resurrected. So, first of all, know this, it was a proven fact in Old Testament Jerusalem, where Jesus was, that any time a teacher would get up and teach the way Jesus taught, that immediately people were writing it down. It was their tradition, it was their custom, without fail. This is why when, when they burned Rome, People, people say part of the reason why, I mean, what, when they burned Jerusalem, when Rome sacked it in 70 AD, about 35 years after Jesus died, the reason that it burned so fast is because there was so much tinder, because they had so many scrolls and so much writing. Now, I'm saying that's true. That's just kind of what they, they say, because the Jews wrote down everything that their teacher said, everything. So, so you have to say, okay, during that period, right, based on the, the writings that they wrote down, we know that up to the point of the most recent manuscripts that were found, okay? Let me read this because I don't want to mess it up. Based on the most recent manuscripts found in the 20th century, it was proven that all the books of the New Testament were written in a period from 20 to 50, some say 70 years after the death of Jesus, okay? It's too short of a period to permit any corruption of the essential content, right? We also know that the people who were writing it, and we're going to get to this in a minute, were directly in contact with Jesus. Okay? Now, there's this thing, it's a big word, called the bibliographical test. That's a big word. I, there's a lot of vowels. Don't ask me to spell it. Hmm, it hurts my tongue. The bibliographical test. You got jokes. The bibliographical test. Tongue, tongue ties me. It's an examination of writings and how they were transmitted from ancient times to us. This testing proves the consistency and validity of writings. Okay? So basically, this is a test that scholars, not Christians, but scholars, people of science, people of, of higher learning, I use quotes, how they determine whether something that we got from ancient history was actually a valid transmission of the original manuscripts, okay? Not only has the New Testament writing been verified to have been pinned 
within the lifetime of the actual eyewitnesses to Christ. But those original manuscripts, so original manuscripts meaning things that they have found that were pinned within the, the lifetime of the eyewitnesses of people who were around Christ. Okay? So in other words, if, if Darby is someone that I am writing stuff down about, as long as within the lifetime of me hearing her personally, writing it down, it's considered an original manuscript. Does that make sense? Okay? 5,600 original manuscripts have been found, examined, and verified. Not only have they been found in places all over, right? Not like all in one place. Matter of fact, 1975, a hidden compartment, I thought this was cool, in Sinai's St. George's Tower was uncovered. 200 more biblical manuscripts, 90 of which were New Testament, were discovered. More than 2,000 copies of the New Testament manuscripts are in, existing, in existence as of 2009. Here's the crazy thing, and this is how they know that they all lined up with the original eyewitnesses. Because, I don't know the countries, but they had them here in Jordan, they had them here in Israel, they had them here in Egypt, they had some that were over here. And do you know what the crazy thing about all of them was? They all lined up. They all said the same thing. That's crazy. So all these ancient manuscripts that were written and translated and passed around, they all said the same thing. Let me ask you a question. If y'all were sitting in here tonight listening to me run my big mouth, and y'all wrote down everything that I said, and then you took it out and you passed it out around the world, do you think even you guys writing it down, it would all say the same thing? No. So for it to say the same thing also has got to tell you somebody else was involved in making sure it did that. Right? God has hand in that. I think that is awesome. So, I'm going to read this to you. Um, the fact that all of the writings were validated by eyewitnesses during the time of Christ with all the proven original manuscripts, you have no choice but to accept the Bible as a trustworthy and historically reliable witness of the real Jesus Christ. And that was said by, I turned the wrong page, a fellow named, hold on, where is that? I thought I wrote his name down. Anyway, the guy that said that, I do remember this part, he was a trial lawyer who had like 250 consecutive cases that he tried and with his evidence, got people acquitted, meaning got them off, right? He did the examination of all the manuscripts, of all the different data, and said, there is no way beyond a shadow of a doubt that you can deny that the people who wrote those were the original people who saw Jesus Christ in the time of his life, while he was alive. So they're all lining up. So, now, if we know that the stories we hear about Jesus, about Him dying on the cross, and about His resurrection, were all written in the Bible, and we don't have any choice but to believe that those were the original words written by people who saw them. We have to believe that the Bible is real, that it, that it has those, those moments captured in time. Because for me, i got to know that. I, I don't know why, I just, I just got to know that, right? When I first became a Christian, I want to know that the Bible wasn't some guy's translation 500 years later who didn't have anything to do with Christ. Because if I'm going to live this lifestyle and follow this, if I'm going to believe with all my heart that Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected and it changed my life, let me be clear with you. We, Victor was saying how I knew him when he first started. And I did. And you talk about a man whose life was drastically changed. A man whose life went from living for himself to living and serving and, and being all about God. I respect that man so much. Y'all, if y'all would have ever met me when I was your age, I wasn't in here. I got so much respect for you guys being in here, trying to figure out what this Christian thing really is about and how to serve and how to be a godly man or woman for Christ. Because that's not where I was. And you know what it created in me? So much misery and so much pain and so much trouble. So when I began to follow this Christian lifestyle, I wanted to know, does the Bible really, is it really real? 
So my faith said yes, but God gave me this stuff so that my mind could line up with my faith, and it helps. Okay. Now I want you to think about this. They killed Jesus on the cross. We have no doubt about that. There are historical records that don't have anything to do with the Bible that talk about this man named Jesus. He started this religion, and the Romans killed him on the cross. There are more things for you to follow there. You can just look that up. There was a man named Jesus who died on the cross. We know that Jesus to be the Son of God. Now, think about this. When he died on the cross, what did they do with him? Because we're going to get to the resurrection, but I want us to get there. I want us to get there and understand why we're there and how we got there. When he died on the cross, what did they do with him? Stuck him in a tomb, right? So they put him in there on Friday. He stayed there Friday night, Saturday, and then Sunday, right? On the third day, he rolled out. Think about in ancient times. Y'all, okay, it's going to sound gross. Y'all ever come up on a dead animal, ride past it on, how's that smell? Ooh, I don't think, I, there ain't, I don't know about y'all, but the smell of a dead animal, ugh. I think my brother's feet are about the only thing that stink worse than the dead animal, okay? But y'all got to know my brother. So, think about this. In ancient times, what do we do with, with people who die now? We stick them in a sealed box and we drop them six feet underground inside of a, another sealed box. Why do we do that? Because we don't want a bunch of stinking dead people, right? The old church we went to, the softball field, right next to it, a big old graveyard. I can't imagine down there, lined up, getting ready. The game's on the line, and then the wind shifts, and you catch a smell of Uncle Frank. And you're like, ugh! And strike three, you're out, game over, right? So how did ancient times, how did they contend with that? Well, they wrapped him in cloth, stuck a bunch of spices Stuck a bunch. I had a boy that we, I had a boy that we were in the military with, and we would come out of PT stinking. We'd been running, sit ups, push ups, and he wouldn't go get in the shower. He'd just spray himself down with cologne, and so now he just smelled like dirty polo. You know, it's just gross, right? So how far do you think that really could go? Wrapping somebody up in some spices and and some linen. How long do you think that's going to last? Maybe a week if you're lucky. So let me show you something. I asked him to bring me this board. So here's what they did, and I thought this was really cool. So this, let's just call this little circle a tomb. They'd stick them in a tomb, right? They'd, they'd take it out of the rock. Then what they would do is here's the ground, right? They would take this little ditch, about yay high, and they would dig it right out from under the front of the tomb, about yay wide, about yay high. In case y'all don't know yay, that means I don't know how high that is. Just something like this, something like this. Then they would take a bunch of dudes, big strong dudes like Victor, right? Big swole up, been, at, been there at the Jerusalem gym all day, hitting the rocks, right? And they would take this massive stone. Now I want you to picture this ditch in front of this tomb. They'd stick the dead person in there, wrapped up in their spices. I think the spices was only just to get them through that moment. And then here they come. Big Dwayne Johnson, the rock, back in Jerusalem. And he, about six, eight guys, they'd take that rock and they'd roll it. And it would drop down in that hole and seal that tomb up. It was all they could do, they say, to just get that rock to roll. And once it dropped down in that hole, it's not coming out. No animals are getting in there. Think about it. Back then, wild animals, right? If it was easy to get into, what would the lions and the hyenas and all that... Ugh, right? Again, be out there at Jerusalem on the baseball field, right? You, your team, it's the dreidels up there against the menorahs. I'm trying to win this game. And then all of a sudden, here come a hyena with Uncle Frank's leg. You know how messed up that would be? So they did this. So it would drop in. Now I want you to think about this. What does the Bible tell us? What does the Bible tell us? Go back to that story. Okay, these were eyewitnesses. It says, uh, and for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. Did I miss that part? Where did, where did the other part go? Uh, oh, I did. And the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone. Thank you, sir. 
and rolled back the stone. An angel from heaven. Just one. That ought to tell you that angels ain't no joke either. I saw a picture the other day, and I thought, boy, if that's an angel, and he did, he looked like the rock. Big armor, sword, big old wings. I mean, raw. I was in the mirror like I could be an angel. And I was like, that hurts. I don't want to do that, okay? An angel came and rolled this rock away. A rock that took six or eight men just to get it there, and it dropped in the hole. And then an angel came and rolled it away. That's awesome, right? Because it wasn't meant to go anywhere. And the angel came and rolled it away. Think about this. <clears throat> Who was stationed out in front of this? What did the Bible tell us? Guards. What type of guards? What would you say? Soldiers. Roman soldiers. For the sake of time, because I get going, I get excited about this stuff. I want to make sure I don't get us in trouble here. For the sake of argument, think about this. Roman soldiers. The baddest dudes on the planet at the time and arguably some of the baddest soldiers ever to walk the face of the earth. They were bona fide, full-time soldiers. Think about Navy SEALs. That were Roman, all them Roman soldiers. Them dudes were hard. They said, they think, okay, again, now this is just speculation. There were anywhere between 16 to maybe 20 soldiers. They purposefully... The Jews asked Pontius Pilate, put a bunch of jokers out there. Why? Because they said somebody will come and steal his body and then claim, oh, Jesus has been resurrected, right? So they said, put a bunch of jokers out there. Anybody know what happens to a Roman soldier when he leaves his post or fails at his mission? Especially because they sealed this with the Roman seal which was a big deal, right? It's a big deal. Listen, I was in the military, and I can tell you that for me, the American flag meant something. You could talk about my mama. You could say something about my clothes. You could make fun of my big old head. I didn't care. You disrespected the flag knowing that I had been a soldier. I, I got a problem with that. That's the way they felt about a Roman seal. That Roman seal said, this is Rome's. And it was their job to protect it. Anybody want to guess what happened if you didn't or you left your post? Executed. Dead. Not jail, not anything. Dead. But somehow, somehow, this massive stone was rolled away. The seal was broke. The massive stone was rolled away in front of 16 or more of the baddest soldiers on the planet at the time. Does that make any sense? Were they Christians? Did they follow Jesus? So the first time that anybody came to try to roll that thing away, what do you think was going to happen to them? They was going to get, right? A little, ah, okay. But somehow, the stone gets rolled away and the body goes. And what does it say? It says, they shook for fear and become like dead men. Something. Use your imagination. Okay. Now, here's what's crazy is they freaked out. If you think about it, so I'll show you something else that I thought was cool. So literally, the well, I might not have space. Literally, the way that the, the soldiers, um, what was the word they used for that? Um, hold on a second. The barracks. I should have known that. Their barracks were literally right around the corner from where they were. What did the Roman soldiers do? They ran to the temple. And they, they went, and it says, <clears throat> uh, they went to the chief priests to seek their help for covering this up. Because they knew that once they came to and realized, uh-oh, rocks rolled away, body's gone, we're going to die. They didn't go to their superior officer, which is what they should have done. They went to the chief priests, right? Because Pontius Pilate had the right to execute them. And if nobody intervened for them, they're all going to die. What did the chief priests do? They said, all right. We got you, right? But here's what you're going to say. And here's how it's going to go. So this is what to me is even crazier is that Jesus, gone. Chief priests still didn't want to give up their power to the point that they told the soldiers to lie about it. Okay? So you tell me, 
there's no way that there had to have been something far greater than just the fear of death to make these soldiers not do their job. That tells me, and we know this from eyewitnesses because that's what we're going to talk about next, that tells me this resurrection thing is no joke. It's real, right? Here's the next thing. Eyewitnesses. So first of all, like I said earlier, there's no doubt that based on the severity and the brutality of the beating and then the spear in the side that Jesus was dead. No doubt. Doesn't matter whether you were Christian, Jewish, Roman, anything you ever read says he was dead. He died. What did the disciples do that had been following him when Jesus, when they saw him dead on the cross, they knew he was dead. There was no doubt in their mind. What did they do? Huh? Run? They rolled out. They were like, not us. They went back home. They went back to fishing. They scattered. Right? Think about scattered. What does scattered mean? They were gone. I hate to tell this story, but I remember one time we was messing around doing something we couldn't. I was like, man, you know, we, we were there talking. We're boys. We got each other. We'll always have each other's back. Always. Right? Like the disciples. We're here for you, Jesus. We got you. But I was like, man, we, we'll always be boys. This is why we do what we do. Cops. Who? Nobody. We left everybody. We didn't care. We were gone. We left each other. Right? Because... When push comes to shove, I wasn't getting in trouble. Here were men that followed Jesus, saw the miracles, saw people raised from the dead, saw all this crazy stuff. He died on the cross, and instead of listening to what he said, they looked at what they saw, and they rolled out. Gone. Went back to fishing. Talk about bored. Can you imagine doing all that with Jesus? And now here I am back throwing nets off a boat. That's disappointing. Okay, what do you think would cause them then shortly thereafter to boldly speak to the point that most historical scholars believe that every single one of the disciples, except John, died a martyr's death, meaning they were killed. Some believe one of them was filleted. Some say Peter was crucified again. This is not in the Bible. This is just what scholars will tell you. Some say Peter was crucified upside down because he refused to be crucified like his Lord. Beheaded. Crazy stuff. What do you think took them from scattered, I'm out, I don't want nothing to do with this anymore, to I'm going to go into the streets and so boldly proclaim Christ and the resurrection and the forgiveness of sins that every single one of them died? Conviction, but what would do it though? Think about that. That's right, conviction. But what would really do that? How about this? Mary Magdalene and the other women who visited the tomb saw him. Matthew 28, 9. The disciples on the road to Emmaus saw him. Luke 24, 12. In the midst of all his apostles, he showed up. Luke 24, 36. For I handed on to you as of importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, and that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, that He appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, and then after that He appeared to more than 500 brothers at once, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. After that He appeared to James, then all the apostles. Last of all, as to one born abnormally, He appeared to me." 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through, 3 through 8. That was Paul. If Jesus, let's think about this. If you were a disciple and the, the man you've been following and the man that you saw do all these miracles all of a sudden was hanging on a cross and dead and you were like, yep, I don't know what happened, but I'm out. And there you are fishing, right? You got your net. You're throwing it off the side of the boat. All of a sudden you turn around and there's a guy making breakfast for you on the shore. You go up to the breakfast, and all of a sudden he reveals himself, and it's Jesus. The same guy you saw brutally beaten, skin ripped off, beard torn out, spear in the side, bled to death, died, and there he is, whole, doing his thing, cooking you some breakfast. You think that would change your entire world? 
So what would have changed that all those men would have died? That all those people would have been martyrs? There were a lot of other people that weren't apostles that died, that were arrested, that were thrown in prison, right? What makes them that bold? When you see the risen Christ. Okay? Here's what I was trying to, walk, to, to do. But let me back up and just ask you this. Some people say, well, the disciples decided they wanted to at least get something out of it. And so they said, all right, even though he, he didn't resurrect, we're going we're gonna to say he did so that we can get a following. Right? Because you got all the naysayers and the haters. And I think that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard because here's my thing. How far would you go for a lie? If it was a lie and the Roman guard showed up and said, hey, you one of those Christians? I'd be like, nah, I was just playing. Much less been killed, put in jail. How far would you go for a lie? Probably nowhere near as far as you'd go if you saw the resurrected Christ. Here's what I was trying to tell you earlier. Sir Lionel Luckadoo, I just was ahead of myself, is considered by many to be the world's most successful attorney after 245 consecutive murder acquittals the brilliant lawyer regularly analyzed the historical facts of Christ's resurrection and finally declares, I say unequivocally that the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so overwhelming, it compels acceptance by proof, which leaves absolutely no room for doubt. And that's a man who wasn't even following Christ. So, Let's dig a little bit deeper into the resurrection itself. I'm about right on time. Without the resurrection, Jesus' death would go without divine approval. If he was not resurrected, he was not fulfilling God's plan because God's plan was listed out in the Old Testament. So if Jesus was not the Son of God and was not resurrected, then it was not approval by God. Okay? Without the resurrection... Oh, somebody read Romans 1.4. Who's got that one? All right, loud and clear. Romans 1 4. Got it? All right, we'll come back to that one. It's okay. The resurrection demonstrates that Jesus' blood of the new covenant saves his people from his sins. Apart from the resurrection, there would be no reason to anticipate the promises of God's kingdom. Who had Matthew 26, 28? All right, Romans 1, 4, read that. Okay, read Matthew, aren't you 26, 28? 26, 28. That's you, who? Do it loud, though, like you're mad at somebody. Okay. Here's something else. Without the resurrection, Jesus' promises would not be trustworthy. If Jesus did not rise from the dead after promising so many times that he would do so, then he was a liar. That'll mess you up. If Jesus did not rise from the dead after telling everyone time and time again that I must be crucified and that I must rise from the dead, then Jesus was a liar. I'm not following a liar, are you? Can you read that? That was Matthew, there was a bunch of those. 12, 40, 16, 21, and 17, 9. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. 16, 21. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciple that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. 17.9 Now as they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. Yes, sir. 
So before the resurrection, when people died, where did they go? Oh, that's a loaded question. That's a great question. Um, so, yeah, well, yeah, so essentially when, when people before the resurrection died, they were, I like to call it in a holding. They were in a holding pattern, right? Because if you think about it, the Bible says that when Christ comes back the second time, the dead will rise in Christ. But what I also try to get my mind around is that I don't think time for them, like I sit and think, man, I wouldn't want to lay in that ground for 2,000 years waiting on Christ to come back again. But time for them is nothing compared to what time is for us. And I think that's a whole other subject. And I'm fascinated by that. And I don't know, honestly, that I have the complete answer for that. I know what the Bible says, but I struggle just trying to get my head around it all. So great question. Way to put me on the spot with that one. That's a great question. Yeah, what do you think? where everybody is but what scholars say is that there is a separation a chasm a great divide so the ones that were god believers were kind of on one side of it and then the ones that were not were on another side so then when he went down and conquered death and hades for good the ones that were uh, on the other side of the chasm then went to go be with him so it's kind of that that holding period dead in Christ will rise first and then you will go. That's a great question though. That's why I said like it's a whole other. Yeah. yeah. Without the resurrection, none of Jesus' promises would be trustworthy. But with the resurrection, how many promises did Jesus make to us? Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. Well, my whole thought is, is if you can be killed like that and raised from the dead and do that, then you ain't got no problem going to make a place for me. That's pretty exciting. Read through. If you think about that, if Jesus fulfilled that promise, every other promise, piece of cake. And you can trust them. You can believe in them. You can know that those days where you're in school and you're trying to follow the Lord and everybody else is going the opposite direction, that you have the answer. And if you trust Him that much, then you'll share the answer with your friend. Okay? But, y'all know C.S. Lewis? Y'all ever seen the books, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe? Right? C.S. Lewis. If you, ever, if you ever read those or watch the movies, it really is the picture of Christ. Right? C.S. Lewis was a... That's right. That was the picture of Christ. He gave the sacrifice. Right, I mean, it was, it was loosely, right? But that was his whole thing. That's why he wrote that. Was because it was a way to share the gospel in a way that wasn't necessarily, he was kind of sneaking the gospel in on people. Okay, But C.S. Lewis was a godly, god, uh, godly man. So he said, mere Christianity. He would have been a deceived person or a deceiver. But since his most amazing promise came true, how can we not depend on and live by Christ's promises for the rest of our lives. Okay? How about this? Without the resurrection, there would have been no apostles to create the church. They scattered. So we said, those guys were so blown away that they went on to start the church and be killed for it. Who's got Matthew 26, 31, and 32? All right. Okay, so it says, I wrote this down because I thought it was cool. The astonishing yet true news brought to the apostles by the two women who first discovered the empty tomb and later by the risen Lord Jesus himself brought the scattered disciples back into the fold and emboldened them, emboldened, emboldened them for witnessing. Who's got Matthew 28, 27? Anybody? Matthew 28, 27? All right, how about 1610? Who's got 1610? Did I miss that card? 28-7. Read that for us, Jen, please. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So here's what I think is cool, 
is the same resurrection that we're talking about that took those 12 guys and scattered them, but then turned them into the boldest speakers for Christ the world's probably ever known, is the same resurrection that can embolden us to get out there and be witnesses for Christ. If we believe in this resurrection and we understand the power that it has, that power lies in us. And you can be the ones out there building the kingdom for Christ. Do you understand that? And I want you to think about this. Some of y'all might sit back and think, Ugh, I'm not that guy. I'm not that girl. Read truly who the disciples were prior to this moment. They were knuckleheads. They were, they were constantly messing up, constantly missing the point, constantly doing the wrong things. God doesn't want the perfect people. He wants you to make His perfectness shine through you and show exactly who He is. Y'all understand each and every one of you has the ability to take the resurrection message and change the world. Don't downplay that. You are here for a reason, for a time such as this. Don't, don't lose sight of that. All right, without the resurrection, there would be no model of sacrificial living. Okay, who's got Matthew 10, 38, and 39? All right, nice and loud. Jesus was buried and rose again, right? Just like we can be. We can die to our old life. We can, we can take the resurrection as a model to how our life should be. We could die to our old life, die to our sins, and be rose again in a power like we've never known. What's crazy to me is when you go back and you look at some of the people that have changed the world for the kingdom the most and look at where they started, it was you. It was you. It was you. It was you. Hey, guess what? It was you. Somebody who was just sitting in a Sunday school one night, sitting in a Wednesday night service, and just really began to take a hold of God's Spirit and was so emboldened that they went out and began to proclaim the gospel in a way that messed people up for all the right reasons. When you first heard the gospel, you weren't looking for it. Not even close, right? I wasn't looking for it. The girl said, hey, you ought to come to church. I was like, when is it? She said, Sunday morning. I was like, ooh, Sunday morning. That's when I sleep in. She said, well, you ought to come this Sunday. We're going to have it eating afterwards. I said, no, I like to eat. Got in there and God got a hold of me and messed me all up. Had my life turned topsy-turvy. That resurrection power took a kid who grew up, now hear me, because this is, this is real, a kid who grew up, parents busted up, dad in jail, mom drank too much, dad did drugs. Every Friday, the wick truck showed up at our house. Back in the day to get free lunch, I had to take a ticket. And I had to walk to the front of the line and go, here's my ticket so I can eat. And kids are mean. Last couple years of high school, until I got a job, I didn't even eat lunch because I didn't want nobody seeing that. My self-esteem was busted. But I was the loudest person in the room. I got more trouble. I got all kinds of dumb things. Why? Because I was trying to figure out who I was. I wanted people to like me. I wanted people to, to, to see me as something special because I certainly didn't feel that way. And then I heard the story of Jesus. And I heard about his resurrection and I thought, wow, that's crazy. That is some serious power there. And then one day when I was reading in the Bible, it, it stuck out to me in my spirit that this God who was raised from the dead, who raised people from the dead, who, who allowed Moses to split a sea, who kept Jonah alive in the belly of the whale, he loved me. And it messed me up. Because I didn't think I was very lovable. 
But it's that resurrection power when you get a hold of that, when you believe it with all your heart, it'll take you places you never, never in a million years when this woman met me. I was 19 and she was 20. We got married young. Never in a million years would she tell you that, hey, I think 32 years from now, he'll be standing in the basement of a church talking about the resurrection. Nope. But it's that resurrection power. Okay? All right, I think we're getting close. So let me, let me kind of wrap this up. So here's what I'm going to say. I'm sorry for those of you that didn't get to read, but I'm going to run through this real quick. Without the resurrection, there would be no perfect peace to right all the earthly wrongs and renew the world and renew yourself. Okay? That's why the resurrection has got to coincide with the crucifixion. The crucifixion happened because God loves us and He took our place. The resurrection happened so that we too can experience that power, that love, right? Untold millions of injustices carried out by human beings throughout world history would have never been made right. There would be no ultimate reckoning for sin and Satan would win the cosmic battle. But the resurrection guarantees that the disciples' model prayer will be answered, that God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. By raising Jesus, God showed all people that they will ultimately answer to Him for what they have done. So be sure the gospel centered on Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is important, but the meaning of the cross is at best unclear without the resurrection. Okay? So I'll wrap it up with this. I appreciate y'all letting me run my mouth tonight. Uh, I, I, I get so excited about this kind of stuff. But here, Jesus is not a dead martyr to be pitied but a living, reigning, returning Lord to be loved and emulated, both in the present suffering and in joy, as well as in future rewards. The resurrection demonstrates that Jesus' blood of the new covenant saves His people from their sins in the grave, and we can trust our lives and eternal future to a living Jesus alone, for alone He is worthy. Amen. So, thank you guys. I appreciate y'all listening. No hard ones like my man hit me with. Woo. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Um, most of them, they say, lined up pretty word for word. But some of the ones that they found maybe that were written later still lined up for the exact same story. Right? So... To me, that's a, that's a pretty compelling reason to know that everything we read was from eyewitnesses and was passed on correctly. <coughs> well, and you know, you know, like the, the people in the court that do the, what's it called, transcribing mm -hmm. or, the, um, or dictation, those were the people that broke down those words. Like, they, they didn't have this, so they had to write down, like, exactly what they heard. And then that's how they became a scroll. And they were like, I think, put through, like some of the priests and stuff would like reread them and make sure, okay, this is approved. And then they roll it up and put it in with the other documents. Great. Anybody else? Go ahead, man. You know how we do it. <laughs> what is a martyr? Someone who dies. So in this case, a Christian martyr dies for the cause of Christ. So a martyr is someone who says, when they come in, and who knows, maybe one day that, that you know, we'll get into a position. What, the greatest thing about our country is that we can do this freely. That no one's going to come in here right now and stop us from gathering together and proclaiming the name of Christ. But there's countries out there where if they catch you, you're in trouble. You realize there are countries out there where people have to hide to come to church. Today. 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 We met a girl... At a conference one time, she was from Iran. Her and her friend were, had backpacks, and they were slipping Bibles to people in their area. And they had an underground church. They, they did church evening time, someone's house, in the quiet. Well, the government found out about it. And the government went in there and busted in the house, rounded those two girls up, said that they were out spreading propaganda and things against Islam and against the government and told both girls the only way we're going to let you live is if you say on video 
that what you've been teaching is false, it's been a lie, and proclaim Islam. And they both said no. Said no. Well, lo and behold, after about three or four weeks, as crazy as it sounds, they hung the first girl and killed her. That's a martyr. The second girl ended up getting away, and she was the one there speaking. Broke my heart listening to her talk. But you understand that there are kids out there that walk miles and miles and miles to churches that could get them in trouble because they're so hungry for the resurrection power of Christ because they want to hear this gospel. And I think sometimes in America, we don't realize how good we got it. We're like, man, I don't want to go to church today, man. The game's on, man, you know. Well, one day it may come down to it where you don't get to go to church. And then you're really going to wish that we had taken advantage of the times that we have. That's a whole other story. We can take probably one more question. Two if we quit. Anybody? I have two things. Yes. So what in his tomb, a borrowed tomb, because whoever's tomb it was, Joseph of Aramea, yeah. knew that he was going to get his tomb back. Yep. So I thought that was cool. And then I also saw something the other day that in the Bible... It never refers to a believer as being dead. They're always falling asleep. Always. It's a believer. So if you ever see that somebody fell asleep, but you know it meant death, they're a believer. If they say they're dead, they're not a believer. I thought it was cool. Listen, did Jesus need them to roll the tomb, the stone away to get out? So why did he allow it to play out the way it's in? Exactly, so people can see it. I thought I always thought that was cool. Mm -hmm. Listen, one thing that I love, and I've said it about Mr. Will, who joined us tonight, and Miss Danny, and I'll say the same for Mr. Sean and Miss Jennifer. They are part of this church, so start a relationship with them. When you see them out and about Sundays, Wednesdays, at events, get to know them. These are the kind of people you need in your life. I told you I'm going to bring people at the end of each month that I trust and believe have your best interest in heart, love Jesus, or trying their best to walk it out. So these are relationships that will help you along your life. These people help me get to this point here, constantly encouraging me. My life looking spooky. She would ask me, yo, what's up, bro? You all right? And you need that. You know what I mean? And you have the exact same access to these wonderful people as I've had. Oh, fix me something to eat. I will go over there. Listen, real quick. I would not want to, I'm trying to get out the streets and not go run around and drink and smoke and mess around. So some nights, instead of being bored at home trying to fight a bunch of temptation, I go over there and eat, man. You know, you need help to make this thing happen. We'll you feed have you. access to that. Not all at once. Can't all of y'all come at the same time now. Right. We'll feed you. All right, let's do our prayer circle and